president of Roman City Youth Literacy Council. And what? Um, and we're sponsored by the Roman City Library Foundation. Um, this month, we're going to be talking about finding money for college. We will go over all the things that you should think about at 13 or, um, we'll go over the things you should think about at 13 or 18, so don't worry if you're not there yet. Um, make sure you've checked in already, so that we can put your name on the list of being here if you have qualified to receive a gift card. Only those people checked in will be called. So you won't get your gift card if you're not checked in, so if you're not checked in, go do that now. Um, uh, at around 5.15, we'll wrap up and present the frame certificates and gift cards to those who have completed the seven of nine sessions. If your name is not called and you believe you have earned a gift card, please stop by to see my mom at the end. Um, we hope that everyone will stay until the presentations are over. Pizza will be served at the end. Any parents arriving should sit at the back of the class. Um, on your chair is the pre-test. If you haven't already done so, please fill this out. If you are done with your session nine pre-assessment, pass it to the aisle for us to pick up. Please take your time now to complete this as we'd like to take, as we'd like to have one for everyone who attends. Um, we'll give you a couple minutes to do that now. All right, so here, who here is planning on going to college? Show of hands. All right, that's good. That's what I like to see. Um, because, first slide, um, that is what it's like for the various degrees that you can get uh, all the way from high school dropout. about. That is the exponential increase of the various degrees that you can get. So the more advanced your degree, the higher your income. And as you can see, going to college drastically raises your money, um, your, the amount of money that you can earn each year. This is, these are just basic figures. So depending on your job, um, that's how the most basic job in every single career field will look. So, yeah. So if you're like me and you like to put everything into numbers, what you do is you figure out, okay, it's going to cost me X dollars to get my doctorate degree, right? And then you compare that to the difference in the cost that you make over your lifetime to figure out if it's worth it. But you also have to remember that are you going to be getting a, a job you enjoy more if you continue on and get more college? So you have to factor that into it as well. The other thing that's not on the slide, which is really important as well, as you go up with higher education, the less unemployment there is. So the more education you have, the less chance you'll be out of a job for any period of time. Because people want you to have more experience. Right. So I know all of you probably have already decided you want to go to college. I just wanted to mention to you that um, it will be worth the money. It's just hard to find the money at the beginning. So that's what this class is about, trying to find the money to pay for college. So college is expensive. <laughs> okay. So the first one is, you're going to plan, okay, I'm going to go to college for four years. How much is that, that college kind of going to cost me? Well, that varies by individual. Because you may decide that you have your heart set on something like Stanford, which can be pretty expensive, or Harvard or something like that, um, and you won't be satisfied until you get that goal. So you're going to have to budget a lot more money to get for your college degree, obviously. But there's some things that you can do to manage your college costs. First of all, there's a thing called 529 plan. Now, a lot of parents may not know about this, uh, and those that are younger see there's a reason why you came here today because this is something you can bring up with your parents. A 529 plan is a savings account that they set up and they put money into every year and it's specifically dedicated towards your college costs. So you may say to yourself, why would my parents want to do that for me because um, they want me to pay for my own college. Well, there are benefits to them setting up this 529 plan, and that's why a lot of parents do this. First of all, there's federal and sometimes state tax advantages for them in setting up that money, which means they wouldn't have to claim that amount as income or it can be sheltered for a certain dollar amount. Um, also, the money that's earned on that money that sits in that 529 plan, they don't have to pay taxes 
$1.6 cents is taken away from the financial aid package. Whereas a dollar that you save on your own, 20 cents of that would be taken away from your financial aid package. So that's why I'm telling you, talk to your parents about 529s. Um, I'm not expecting you to know a lot about it now. It's just a savings plan when you're younger that your parents would have set up and it's accumulating growth so that by the time that you go to college, you have this nest egg sitting there. And it has given them tax advantages along the way. Okay? There are two types of 529 plans. One is you can actually buy a plan where you're paying in today's dollars of what your degree will cost, no matter when you go to college. So if you set that up when you're three years old, you'd be paying the amount for that at three years old um, for when you go to college at 18. Now, very few states offer this anymore. Obvious reasons, right? Because uh, the predicted amount of a state college cost is, is very unpredictable. So now most of them are just doing this plan where you put money in and it accumulates growth and there's tax advantages to doing that. Another um, way that you can save, how, another way that you can manage college costs is one way you can find a lower cost college, but that's not the only way you can do it. There's lots of ways that you can find ways to lower your base costs of going to college. Like if you go to a school that's close to you, maybe you don't have to pay for room and board and food and all that other stuff, because that adds up. So that way you can just live at home and then commute. Um, so there's other challenges that come with that, obviously, but you take a good look at that. Um, also, um, you could go to a community college versus a four-year college which is where you can go to a community college for two years, which is where you gather up all your basic classes, then the four-year colleges just want you to go for it so they can get your money, but the community colleges offer those classes for way cheaper, and you can just transfer in later, and that way um, you don't have to end up paying as much for a four-year college. A lot of people like the four-year college experience, but that's if you're trying to save money, that's the first way to go. And you can check with your ideal four-year college because a lot of them will guarantee you entrance if you get a certain GPA at the community college. And I will tell you, it's a lot less expensive to go to, say, Foothill, uh, San Mateo Community College, something like that. And you're not losing anything, because they're just the basic classes that you take the first, the first two years, because you have to take these basic classes in order to get your degree. But um, those specialized classes that come with the college, which will end up getting you the degree, that happens later when you actually go to the college. You could just do the first two years and get all your basic classes out of the way. And then the last two years you spend at the four-year college where you do everything else. And another option is um, my son goes to UCSB. When he comes home for the summer, he might take a, a summer's course at, say, Foothill. And the Foothill course will be a lot less expensive, but he can still transfer the credit to UCSB. And then when he's taking really heavy classes like chemistry or stats or something like that, he has the luxury of just taking three classes instead of four. So you have to think about that. And I will tell you, for instance, Foothill is an example. They offer an intensive course, which is only two weeks long, and you get a whole term. I've taken that in Spanish. So and it's free. Brian's taking Spanish three, which he's going to need to get into college. It's free for me because I go to uh, high school. So. Yeah, when you're in high school, you can take college credits for free. I don't know if it, all of you knew that or not. So that's a pretty, really good benefit for California students. So anyway, it's very intensive two weeks, but then you don't have to take that course for a whole term. Yeah, every college is different. So um, there's all sorts of loopholes and ways that you can get out of certain costs if you don't want the extra mm -hmm. stuff. But find, once you figure out what your money is, I know my goal is that everyone here today is going to go home and talk to their parents about how they're going to save them a ton of money, right? Because what's funny is that if you look at the scholarships out there, you would think that if you look at low-income people, middle-income people, and high-income people, the majority of the scholarships go to who do you think? I heard hi. Yeah? The low income people should be getting them, but the majority of scholarships 
go to middle income people. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, my guess is there's probably a lot of reasons, Most but my guess is they're more educated as far as what's out there, which is my goal for you today. So right? Is. So I want all of you to be able to get at least an average uh, scholarship for people that apply for scholarships is uh, $1,600. So for you to get $1,600 with the scholarships, you need a million to call. Okay? And it's just a matter of knowing where to find the money and then applying. But the money's out there. Yeah. Why does advocacy cost more than MGA? That's a good question. Now, private universities, that is not the case because they are um, a lot, some of them are for profit. So it doesn't matter to them if you're coming from Colorado or Michigan or California. But the ones that are state, like the UCs, the CSUs, et cetera, those institutions um, are required because of federal grants that they get that they have to offer a certain percentage of their applicants to go to their college. And so they will offer a break to in-state tuition for that reason. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're paying for college, you want to bridge the gap so there's five types of financial aid. The first is gift aid. So that's free money that does not need to be repaid. Okay, and that, most of you know that is scholarships. There's also, sometimes they're called grants. And um, there's also federal and state aid, which is not, does not need to be repaid. That's usually money that you win by fulfilling some kind of requirement. Yeah. So or is not really applying. No. Yeah, applying. Yeah. Yeah. The second one is student employment. Now this was on your pretest, right? And I'll give you an example of this. Um, when I went to graduate school, um, I was paying for it myself, and so um, I wanted some spending money so I could go out on the weekends. And so I went into the financial aid office at the college and I asked them, you know, is there a job or something that I could do? The reason why student employment is so nice, and you hear a lot about athletes is an example of doing this, right? First of all, my hourly rate was more than I, what I would have gotten had I gone out. So you, they will give you more than what you would normally get if you worked at McDonald's or something. The other thing is they plan around your school schedule. So you can say, you know, I'm in labs uh, Fridays from 9 to 12, and then they'll say, okay, we won't have you work during that time. So um, I was a teacher assistant, so I helped teach classes and uh, grade tests. Uh, so that time I had to book, but everything else I didn't. Like one time I um, worked with a finance professor and I did a bunch of computer input for him and that was all on my own time. So the nice thing about student employment is that you earn while you learn, okay? Uh, student loans. They're repaid after graduation over years with interest. The number one type of student loan right now is called the Federal Perkins Loan. Now, you might want to mention this to your parents if you want to get a loan for college. Um, it offers $5,500 for each year, up to four years of undergraduate study, and the interest rate is 5%. Now, all of you know now, how much do you earn on money in, in your bank account? Less than 1%, right? So 5% is not, you still don't want to pay 5% if you can get away with it. So that's what we're going to talk about now, is how to find other money beyond student loans where you're going to be paying interest. Okay? The next one is an education tax benefits. 
ROTC. Those are kids that are military based and the military will actually pay for your college um, in exchange for you doing some sort of service for them at the end. So the best type of student aid is the free kind, right? Because the other, other ones have strings attached to them. So scholarships and grants are the things you really want to be focusing on. Today, landing college scholarships for many high school students, dreams of attending college may not become a reality without the help of additional money. And there's nearly three billion dollars out there just waiting to be claimed. College admissions expert Catherine Cohen is the founder and CEO of Ivy Wise. Good morning, Kat. Good to have you here. Good morning. And I know there's a big deadline coming up. March 31st is a deadline for a lot of these scholarships. We're talking about free money here, right? So yes, unlike loans, to get on board. you don't have to pay them back. And so we're telling students to research and apply to as many good fit scholarships as possible because time is money. And for that March 31st deadline, there is still time, so students should get working right away. Right, and the application process in itself, I mean, let's get to some of the criteria. How do some of these scholarship committees determine what, who, who makes for a good fit for their scholarships? Well, there's scholarships out there for high school students, undergraduates, graduate students, and the criteria vary from scholarship to scholarship, but a lot of them are gonna look at a student's GPA, test scores, resume, essays, letters of recommendation, and oftentimes they're gonna to wanna to do some kind of an interview. And you mentioned there's so many different types of scholarships out there, university, heritage, career, corporate, regional, and then some other unusual scholarships. Unusual ones, so yeah, I love this, because there's literally thousands of scholarships out there. So there's one if you're great at calling a duck, and there's one uh, for wearing the best duct tape outfit to the prom. Really? So yes. there's something for everyone. There is you something. just have to know where to find it. Exactly. And then there's, of course, the bigger ones, like the corporate ones, like Coca-Cola offers 250 high school seniors up to $20,000. Yeah. Um, those tend to be more competitive. Um, also, universities offer their own scholarships. So they'll offer um, merit-based scholarship based on a student's academic, athletic, or, or artistic achievements. And sometimes they'll even offer full tuition. And those are called um, trustee scholarships or presidential scholarships. Now, because there are so many scholarships out there, how do you, how do you go about finding them? Well, the first place to look is online. There's, there's free um, online tools that where basically you can put in your information, your profile, your background, you know, what your interests are, your abilities, and, it's gonna, and these tools are gonna match you mm -hmm. with the right scholarship. So you can look at fastweb.com, collegeboard.com, and scholarships.com. And you can also ask your high school guidance counselor. They're gonna often um, recommend students for certain scholarships. Also right. look at a college's website. There's usually a scholarship section right on the website. And make it easy for you. Now, oh, one of the big things you have to make sure is you don't make mistakes in the application process because that immediately will throw that scholarship opportunity perhaps out the window. So what are some things that you need to be aware of? Well, first of all, the most competitive scholarships have thousands of applicants. So if you don't meet the criteria or you, you, know, you haven't followed directions, you know, mm -hmm. filling out the application, then you're gonna be um, disqualified in, in the first round. So you definitely wanna think about um, making sure that you complete everything, all the components of the application, do it on time. Don't forget to sign the forms. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> sign the forms. Follow directions, so many students forget about this. Make sure somebody's proofreading your application. Um, they're reading the fine print. Exactly, reading the fine print. And you don't want to um, just write one generic application and send it to multiple scholarships. You know, look at each scholarship's criteria. So you're not gonna send that MP3 of your duck call to right. a scholarship that's looking you know, more at your academics and your grades. And you say you also may have to reapply every year to continue the scholarship, right? Exactly, don't assume that a scholarship is gonna be awarded for four years in a row. A lot of them are gonna ask you to reapply and they'll also require you to, for example, maintain a certain GPA to mm -hmm. get it that following year. And, and one thing you should be aware of, there are scholarship scams out there. What are some of the things that you should look out for if your child, student is applying? There are. You don't want to look at a scholarship that's asking for any kind of an application fee or fees of any kind. And you also don't pay attention to scholarships that 
promise you guaranteed winnings. They're usually going to be scams. And you say, lastly, to apply for um, scholarships that fewer scholarships, but that offer big awards, or actually apply for a greater number of scholarships that are offered perhaps a little bit less rather than the big scholarships. Smaller awards, yes. Yeah, so Smaller if you're looking awards. at more local scholarships or scholarships that have more unique um, criteria, you're oftentimes going to get smaller applicant pools, so you, mm -hmm. you'd have a greater chance of winning those scholarships. And scholarships range from a couple hundred dollars to full tuition, and every little bit counts, it all adds up. So it's definitely worth it to apply for as many scholarships as you, know, you qualify for. Absolutely, free money as you said, yes. so go for it. Yes. All right, Kat Cohen, it's always great to have you here, great information. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, 
if you're a star athlete and they need a bully for their soccer team, then they may accept you over someone else, even though your GK might be a little bit lower. Um, you may have specific skills that they need. Um, it can be, there's some weird ones out there, fencing teams are out there, is it like that? Um, so, and then the, the next group of scholarships are uh, specialized, so it'll be like a field of study. So if you're going to be a lawyer, you'll see that there's some scholarships just for pre-law degrees, or scholarships just for psychology degrees, etc. So, so the earlier you can try to narrow down what you want to be, I know journalism is a big one. There's a, quite a few scholarships for journalism out there, the newspapers put out there. So uh, the earlier you can decide which, what, you want your, what you want your major to be in college, uh, the better for that. Also, there's a lot of weird like scholarships. Wait, I'm not, I'm not going to this group yet. Okay. okay. Um, Underrepresented groups, this can be um, LG. And 
then you go in there and you fill out a, a little check sheet and it'll say things like, you know, what's your race, what's your hobbies, are you, what clubs are you a member of? For instance, if you're a member of Key Club at school, uh, there's definitely scholarships out there for Key Club members. If um, Eagle Scout, my brand is, there's scholarships for Eagle Scouts out there. So um, they'll ask you those particular things. So I'll also ask you some strange things, like do you think you might go into pre-med or journalism? They'll ask you, um, uh, are your parents an alumni of, and they'll have some listings of scholarships of uh, alumni associations that will offer scholarships. So my main thing is, uh, there are some major, major scholarship search services out there that are free. So don't spend the money, use these. Don't use a ton of them, use like maybe two or three, because you wanna be spending your time more on looking at the criteria for, for what they're looking for, rather than you know searching multiple websites. So there are some nonprofit organizations that are clubs, right? Ryan is a member of a couple different organizations that he does charity work for, and they send out uh, emails at least monthly with a whole listing of grants and scholarships that are out there available. Because they know that their um, kids or teens that are involved in volunteering are the ones that would more than likely qualify for those scholarships. So um, that's how he's gotten the ones that he's gotten so far, because they are based on criteria that you know, he's been emphasizing, which is volunteer work. So Youth Service America is one of those, and do something.org. The nice thing about do something.org, um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, do something.org is all team-based, like the whole thing, it's catering towards you guys. Um, they do a whole bunch of volunteer projects. Um, they're really super easy, and um, they offer scholarships too for um, kids your age. So, yeah. Yeah, some of them are literally five minutes. Yeah. And you post a picture of you doing whatever it is they say, like, you know. Um, what I did is I took pictures of my dad doing healthy things. So we just got together like five seconds for every day and just like drank a glass of water, or like ate an apple, and then that was it. So, and then yeah. they take all those kids that post pictures and they'll offer one $1,000 scholarship for those kids. So there's going to be a lot less applicants doing that than, you know, these Coca-Cola ones that she talked about, you know. Yeah, only one guy's going to win that. Yeah. And so, so that guy's going to have like a 5.0 GPA and do all this stuff. So not to discourage any of you, but it's pretty much impossible. But... So I, I encourage you to go for the, the ones that offer less money and have less competitors. <laughs> I don't, I don't, Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay. So let me go through uh, locations real quickly, and then we'll get into um, what you, be, you should be doing no matter what age you are to get, actually earn these scholarships. So the next place to look for scholarships is uh, your future college. Okay? So say you narrow down your schools to your top five. You go onto their websites and they'll have, go into their financial aid section and they'll have a listing. Do they have an alumni scholarship available? Do they have a, um, you know, write an essay, tell us why you deserve this sort of scholarship available. A lot, a lot of them do. And the other thing I want to mention too once you get your financial aid package, if it's not enough and you think that you need to turn it down, you can always go back to them and say, I really want to go to your college and we work on this financial aid package. So it's not set in stone. I just want to mention that for them. So um, of students who receive scholarships, 61% of them get them from the college they're going to. And I will tell you, uh, for my older son as an example, it didn't matter if he was in state or out of state because every single out of state school he applied to offered him a matching in state tuition. And that was kind of interesting because we actually eliminated a couple schools off of the, his list because we thought, oh, that's too expensive for out of state students. 
But if you look at their in-state tuition and you, you think that they're going to match it, then you know it really does put them back into your ballpark. So also your guiding counselor at high school, um, the, they might post scholarships outside their office, so walk by there, get to know them. By the way, more than likely that guidance counselor will also need to submit a letter of recommendation for you. So you want them, especially people that are at big high schools, make sure they know your name, go in there, introduce yourself. Um, and then also they might actually tell you about some scholarships that come up. For instance, um, Ryan applied for a leadership academy this summer um, at St. Francis, and which was recommended by his college counselor. So, you know, if you get to know something like that, you know, it, it, you do get benefits from it. Also, they'll have on there, like, uh, steps you take to get to college. Now, how many people know if their high school offers this or not? It's usually called Navion. If you look into Naviance, and this, this is why I'm bringing it up, because I will tell you, I can't tell you how many students don't even realize this is a gold mine for you, a gold mine for you. On Naviance, their counselors will post all the scholarships that come through their counselor office. And then they'll put it on there and they'll say when the deadline is, the amount of it, if it has any specific requirements. And you can click on that link and it'll bring you right into the scholarship website application page. So I will, it will, it's important to know whether your counselor is good or not at school because sometimes they'll put it, won't put enough detail and you'll go in there and it'll say, for instance, um, you know, my other son clicked, said he'd be um, fit this one, he clicked on it, it was for only African Americans, right? So clearly he didn't, he didn't qualify for that. So you want to limit as much um, uh, work that you're going to be doing, and your counselor is doing that work for you. So go into Naviance, and also all those questionnaires they force you to take, depending on what you're in, you're in, you know, freshman, sophomore, senior, senior, you all have to take these questionnaires. Um, those questionnaires will help you determine what your major is going to be. Okay? Um, so. It may seem like it's not worth the time now, but it really, really will help you later on. The other thing, they want you to update your resume on that Navion system. Now, other schools, it might be called something different, but they all offer them. And what you may say, why well, do I want to really update my resume? That seems boring. But when you apply for the scholarships, they'll ask you things like, what month or what year did you do that? You know? Um, who was the contact person for that activity you did. So if you update the resume online that the school's offered, um, you'll have all that, all that information that's your benefits. So use the tools you have. And um, let's see, the next one, the guidance counselor sometimes put it in the high school bulletin. Um, you'll also notice sometimes we'll have like, this school's coming to visit, right? So you can go in just for a couple minutes and ask that school if you're interested, if they're like in your top 10 and say, you know, can I get any information you have on your financial aid packages or any scholarships you have? And then, you know, they'll know that you're serious enough to think about money. Um, there's also books here in the library. They have a whole row uh, where you just go through and it's done by category. So if you're a writer, you don't mind writing essays, you can go there. If you're Filipino, they'll have a section in there. If you uh, uh, play trombone, there'll be a section in there. Trombone plays your hand. <laughs> so there are um, the books in the library. The problem with a book versus doing the online searching I was talking about is what? Can someone tell me what the problem is? Yeah. Books are outdated. Exactly. By the time it gets to print, it's usually at least two years outdated. And scholarships can come and scholarships can go. Like, I really don't think that Coca-Cola scholarship is even available anymore, and that pity is only six months old. Okay. Pretty? I know, but a lot of them stopped doing it. OK. 
continued to take on bigger and bigger projects each year and that sort of thing. So he has a story to tell. So even if you're in eighth grade or uh, a freshman, you can be starting this and trying to figure out what story do you want to tell, okay? And if you look at, and by the way, there are some scholarships no matter what your age is. You can be nine and get a scholarship. You just talked about how somebody got, uh, is in eighth grade, got a scholarship to Stanford already. So, so, you know, it doesn't matter your age. There are scholarships specifically for juniors and seniors only. And they do that because they want to narrow the application pool down because they don't want to be reading 50,000 applications. And they know that those kids really need the money for college. But you will be able to find some for younger children. Okay. So your college counselor, get to know them. Your teachers, starting from freshman year, pick your favorite teachers that will say good things about you. And those two things may not be the same, okay? You want someone that is, they're gonna get a lot of kids asking them for recommendations, okay? So you need to make sure that they know you personally, that they are willing to spend the time and ask early. So a lot of kids go in right at the start of their senior year and they'll be going into their teacher and be one of 75 kids that want a recommendation. And that's, that's not an over-exaggeration. I'm, I'm telling you from past experience. So my older son, what he did is he went junior year about May before the summer and went in and talked to the teachers and say, you know, I really want a recommendation from you. And then they were able to gather, one teacher said, you know, tell me about, you know, all of this sort of thing. Other teacher said, all of you choose your resume on Nottingham's. Well, you know, he had his own resume, so we had to quickly update Nottingham's resume, right? So, so it, it, it helps to start early and just add to that Nottingham's resume. Because you're definitely your college counselor, which, by the way, is required to give you a recommendation. Um, so make sure you know who they are. And if you get little awards, send them little emails. Make sure they know you're getting these awards, that, uh, that, um, that you've done something good. And then the teachers. You know, English teachers, a lot of times are asked to do recommendations because they're good writers. Right? Now but, is the time to start developing personal relationships with your teachers. You know? You gotta pick once when you're looking for a recommendation that respects you both academically and they also know you on a personal level. So that way they can tell like personal anecdotes about you and also say that you were a good student in the class. Because if they can't say that you were a good student in the class but they like you, then they still have to put that on the resume. And the, the nice thing too, for scholarships, a lot of them will require recommendations. Uh, I, I wouldn't say a lot of them, I'd say about 20% or less um, do. Um, but if you're already getting them for college anyway, why not go and ask them to write one for scholarships? And then once they have that template, you can keep going back and asking and asking and asking, and they just change the name on that recommendation letter, right? So um, start early. And then if you have a, t a favorite teacher when you're a junior and they teach a senior class, all the better. Because uh, recommendations are better if it's a teacher you have later on. So you wouldn't pick a teacher you had as a freshman, as an example, right? Uh, but if that freshman teacher teaches a junior or senior class, and you go and take one from them, then they have two points of reference to talk to you about you with. But they usually put things in there like, oh, they were in this quartile of the whole class. Um, they offered this during group discussions. But you want to uh, tell them, so you'll go up and ask them, can I have a recommendation? And then you'll also say to them, you know, um, if you don't mind, I'll email you some important things that I've done that you might not know about. And then you can say, you know, these are my outside activities. Uh, you may not know that these are the school clubs I've been involved in. These are the outside clubs I've been involved in. 
Um, but you know, that's that's why I want to talk to the, the younger ones and the older ones because the clubs that you've been in as a freshman, usually if you stay in them by junior, senior year, you should so, show some progression as, as far as leadership, maybe be on the board or uh, be an officer. You don't so they're going to be looking for that progression over the years. You also don't have to be that blunt when you ask with your teachers, like because there are people too, they remember things. So like if you talk to them uh, like way back when about this thing that you, this awesome thing that you did, they're going to remember that because they know you as a person as well as a student. So yeah, that's what you get from the benefit of being in a small high school class is that your teachers know you on a personal basis and that's why it's good to get recommendations from the ones that you like and they like you. So. And a lot of times it'll be someone, uh, I know at St. Francis that they teach, they also have to do two extracurricular, either a sport or a club. So a, a lot of those people will know you from two points of reference, which is always better in the reference, the reference. because they don't, the only way you're going to stand out is if your recommendation is different than the other 75 that are right.
yourself in five years or name your favorite author, why is that important? Those standard questions get changed every year, but the themes are very, very similar. And if you read them now, then when you're in uh, your English classes and have to write an essay, you can gear them towards that. That's what I'm saying. So don't copy the essay for like five different scholarships, but it can form the basis and then you can alter it for that. Because each scholarship will also have word count requirements and, you know, uh, themes. Some will require footnotes, you know. So my older son didn't do any writing exercise that required footnotes. <laughs> he hated that. So uh, if, if writing's your thing, there's a lot of applications out there for that, scholarship applications. And then if you become a finalist now, the latest thing is you'll have to conduct an interview. Ryan's got an interview tomorrow morning, right? Uh, so they get it through different phases. Uh, you fill out an application. You have to submit your video. And then they'll do an interview over the phone with you. And then they'll fix your finals. So why do you think they do that now more than they did before? So I'm sure there's many more than that. Um, and then clubs, I 
I mentioned Key Club. Uh, it can be uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts after scholarships. Um, now these will be smaller dollars, but they'll be easier to win because there'll be a much smaller pool of applicants. So plan years in advance because a lot of times it'll say like you have to be a member of the Elks Club for three years before you can apply. So you'll want to do that as a freshman, so by the time you're ready to apply as junior or senior, you've met that qualification. Okay? And I will tell you, Elks is an example offers pretty big scholarships. And if you've learned anything from this whole Money Smarts class, you should know by now that you don't miss deadlines, ever, or anything. <laughs> uh, like the time when you have to turn something in, no, yeah, it's they, they literally won't even open your envelope if you're past the deadline. So they'll just put it in the trash. So that 2,000 word essay you wrote is gone. So there you go. So you'll notice on your post test that all of these requirements are going to be included, all right? Um, and then um, make sure you double check your work, proofread, um, have your parents or another student proofread your work. And word counts are important. What will happen is you'll, you'll think you're fine. You're typing in the little box, because a lot of the applications are online now. And then you'll hit send, and when you get back the final copy they give you, it will cut it off at the word count, because it will be in the middle of a sentence. Because it won't warn you a lot of times. So be careful about the word count. Sometimes when you do it in Word, it will be different. So usually they have a little counter, and it will count it down for you. Right? And review the rubric for judging purposes. A lot of times we'll say we're looking for this. And you know, we'll give you five points if your show you had a leadership position. We'll give you three points if you have been involved in the club for five years or more. You know, so there's different rubrics. Oh, I just wanted to ask, um, I've heard a lot about these. Uh, professional college consultants, especially in this area where there's families with lots and lots of money to hire these people that work with these students literally for four years and pretty much almost guarantee they get into the college perhaps for top 10 colleges. What is your opinion about those consultants and are they worth the money? In my mind, they're not worth the money because this is your life. You want to be doing what you want to do. So follow what your passion is, right? Don't let somebody else tell you what your passion is. And I think if you um, just get involved in the things that you really have skill in or passion in um, and keep track, like I said, on the college Navion system, um, you'll be right up there anyway. And I, I do think when you speak from that heart, uh, it comes across in your essays and also in your applications to college. Yeah. Why pay somebody else to do what you could do yourself for free and then keep that money and spend it on something like, I don't know, bubble gum, whatever. <laughs> so, there you go. And there is a lot of money out there. Um, so, it's, you have to de decide what amount of work you want to spend doing what. And so during the summer is a good time to do the search. Find out what's out there. You'll see some require essays, some require just achievements, some require recommendations, etc. So see what's out there and see what you really want to do. Because anybody could win an essay contest, right? You don't have to have had a you know certain GPA or whatever for that. They just want to know that you can write well and that you're passionate about whatever topic it is. And I know if you're good at speaking, I know uh, uh, different postmasters, mine, et cetera, they offer speaking scholarships. And not many kids like to do that, so you may be one of five that apply for that scholarship. So pretty good odds. Well, I'll give you an example. When, when I was in high school, my father was a member of the American Legion. And being a teenager, I didn't want to have anything to do with the American Legion. So he said, oh, you know, American Legion is offering this scholarship. I think you ought to apply for it. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. And he said, OK, you know, just do it. Just do it for me. So I applied, and it was uh, you had to give a speech. And I was the only one there. <laughs> and I got $1,000 for just getting up there and giving a speech. And then I went to the state level. And of course, the prizes were a lot bigger there. 
about the different amendments to the Constitution and everything. So needless to say, I didn't win any more money at that level because I didn't want to, that wasn't my passion, right? But a lot of scholarships will be out there and it, you just have to look and see if you're willing to do the work. So the last thing I wanted to cover, and your parents will probably take care of this, but you have to be on them and make sure they meet the deadline. Right? Because if you miss the deadline, you will not get financial aid. Okay? So this is called the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Okay? FAFSA. Free Application for Federal Student Aid. That's on your final desk. <laughs> so um, this will calculate your expected family contribution and a lower Expected family contribution will give you more aid and also will uh, qualify you for certain grants, like the Pell Grants. But only if you fill out the FAFSA will you get this free money, free money, okay? And even if you fill out the FAFSA, they'll offer you loans at that point too. But what do we know about loans, right? Scholarships are better because they're free. You gotta pay them back.